everyone, and welcome to Strand Explains. As always, I'm Sakshi, and I'm joined by RK. Hey, RK, how are you? Hey, Sakshi, really, really doing well today. Yeah, and that's we have a special guest, and that's that's really why. I know, I'm so excited. So let's just cut to the chase. Um, today we're here with Dr. Nishant Agarwal. He's currently the chief of otolaryngology head and neck surgery from U Chicago, having done his undergrad at Rutgers, followed by his MD residency and postdoc from Johns Hopkins University, as well as his fellowship from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, Dr. Nishant's research interests include genetic and molecular diagnostics of head and neck cancer, and his lab has worked on mapping the genetic underpin underpinnings of a variety of cancers, including esophageal, medullary thyroid cancer, as well as head and neck squamous cell cancer carcinoma, which we will discuss today. Hi, Dr. Nishant. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Sakshi. Hi, RK. Great to see you both. Great to see hey, you. Hi, Nishant. Likewise. How are you doing today? Doing great. It's a beautiful uh, morning in Chicago, still a little bit cold, but clear skies, so we'll take it. Oh, that's nice, yeah. I the mean, snow is melting. <laughs> I was about to ask how the, how, you know, how things are going there otherwise. No, it's nice now. It's, um, it's uh, relatively nice in the 30s and 40 degrees <laughs> Fahrenheit. <laughs> relative, relative to be sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so I thought we could maybe start by just, um, I, I could start by maybe asking you about your journey to becoming an otolaryngology head and neck surgeon. Uh, what was your inspiration? What got you there? And just a personal question, if you could explain the distinction between otolaryngology and otolaryngology head and neck surgery, because it kept popping up and I was like, this is very cool, but I don't know what the difference is. <laughs> Yeah, no, sure. I think it was confused. It's confusing for a lot of people. So um, my journey first. So, um, you know, I, I was born in India and um, uh, my, uh, emigrated to the United States when I was about seven. And um, I, my nanny or maternal grandmother um, had breast cancer when I was a toddler. And I think it was a very heavy burden on my mom and my Masi, my sister's mom. And I think passively, um, I, I, it must have sort of affected me. Um, so for the longest time, or as long as I can remember, I, I always wanted to do something with cancer. And um, so I did um, apoptosis research in college at Rutgers, and then went to medical school, um, did some neuroscience research with um, um, one of the eminent researchers, Saul Snyder. Um, but my heart was always sort of oncology. Um, and um, so I, during our medical school rotations, um, I really loved surgery and I had great mentors um, um, who supported me in ENT, including um, some of the greatest otolaryngologists, Dr. Charlie Cummings and Dr. David Isley, who um, were, um, uh, amazing mentors for me and really supported uh, me. So for me, the combination of oncology and surgery and then my mentors in otolaryngology became obvious for me um, to pursue um, otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and then eventually head and neck surgical oncology. Um, and so in terms of my research, so um, while I did um, neuroscience research in medical school, um, I talked to my mentor at that time, Dr. Saul Snyder, and I said, look, I, I, love, I love what I'm doing. I want to do cancer research. Um, and there was um, <clears throat> a legend uh, at, at Hopkins, Dr. Bert Vogelstein, um, who was um, really like sort of this untouchable guy. And um, so, so I was like, well, let me email Bert. And um, he did. And um, I had met Bert um, at the airport once. And then um, in, in one of his lectures, I asked him a couple of questions afterwards. Um, so that was uh, my introduction to um, Bert Vogelstein and Ken Kinsler and my uh, career in uh, cancer research. So in terms of otolaryngology and head and neck surgery versus otolaryngology, you know, ultimately it's all the same. Um, 
I think a lot of people struggle with such a long name, otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, or OHNS. So the vernacular, most people just call it ENT or ears, nose, and throat. Mm -hmm. The field is pretty diverse where there's a medical component and a surgical component to it. So maybe the medical component some people consider as otolaryngology and the surgical component is otolaryngology, head and neck surgery. But as otolaryngologists, we do a little bit of both. Um, and then within otolaryngology, there's a subspecialty called head and neck surgical oncology. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. So we basically um, cut out cancers. Um, so um, we, I cut out cancers of the head and neck. Um, and that's very sort of a specialized field within otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, or otolaryngology, or ENT. I see. Thanks so much. That, that's, yeah, that I, I didn't know that that was, I mean, Sakshi was asking me this question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also learned how to pronounce otol otolaryngology for the first time, not with a <laughs> jaw, but with a yeah. jaw. Yeah, I yeah. did the same mistake. <laughs> I took yeah. Latin in high school, so it's helpful in this, in, in my profession. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not that helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i remember reading a little bit of latin and well it was all latin to me wait <laughs> <laughs> you know we were going to talk about some of the work that you've done in coronavirus but you know it's it's so interesting you know that you mentioned you know this interest in cancer genetics so i thought we could just sort of talk about that for a second, uh, you talk about Bert Vogelstein, and of course he's a, a luminary uh, at Johns Hopkins, and you know in liquid biopsy, for example, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so on. And I guess, um, so would you say, for instance, that this speciality, just focusing on auto otolaryngology, um, does it have any particular manifestations? I I'm sure it has. So particular manifestations that become interesting uh, in the US, and we're going to talk about the India manifestations shortly later in this podcast, but I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit on what it looks like, you know, examining these people that come in uh, uh, in, in, a, in the US, do they come in at a later stage? How advanced is it? Why are they getting head and neck cancer, for example? Just wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, so worldwide, um, there are about 600,000 cases of head and neck cancer. Um, India is responsible for about a third of them. Um, and then the US has about 50 to 60,000 cases. Um, and the United States, about, this is very rough estimates, about a third are oral cavity or mouth cancers, about a third are oropharynx or sort of throat cancers, the tonsils and the back of the tongue, and about a third are larynx or voice box cancers. Um, in the United States, um, a, about 80 to 90% of the throat, the oropharyngeal cancers are driven by HPV or human papillomavirus, um, which is unique right now to, to North America and Western Europe, although there's lower incidence um, in other parts of the world. Um, so that has been an exponential um, epidemic really in the United States is HPV associated oropharyngeal cancer. Um, in India, a lot of the head and neck cancers are driven more by um, tobacco and smokeless tobacco like betel nut use um, and excessive alcohol. So the major risk factors for head and neck cancers are tobacco, um, smokeless tobacco like betel nut, alcohol, and then um, human papillomavirus or HPV and then Epstein-Barr virus or EBV. Um, EBVs drive this, this site called nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Um, and that's uh, more unique in, in Southeast Asia. Right, and and I, and that's very interesting that the the uh, the origins of these diseases are completely. Although the incidences are very high in both geographies, it's as though they have different causes in in these yeah. different continents. And yeah, so yeah, it's amazing that the end result ends up being similar, but how you get there is very different. And then you had talked about presentation at early versus advanced stages. You would think a mouth cancer would be very 
obvious to detect and identify at early stages, um, but it's a struggle um, in the field for our patients and us to identify early stage um, head and neck cancers. And unfortunately, most um, cancers that we treat um, are at late stages or um, stages when they've already metastasized the lymph nodes. Um, and that's really a challenge across the world. It's not unique to any one geography. Um, the, the challenge is really at advanced stages, the prognosis is much worse. The um, quality of life um, is not as good as if we're treating early stage cancers. Um, the um, morbidity is higher with late stage, the mortality is higher with late stage, and the cost of care is significantly higher for advanced stage cancers. So we really would want to try to prevent these cancers, and we can talk about that and or detect them at earlier stages. I see. Um, I mean, speaking about that, I think one of the things that comes to mind when you're talking about both the detection and treatment is how much has changed in this field in the last 20 years, um, just in terms of our abilities. Um, like we said, we're going to talk about liquid biopsy in a second, but even in terms of um, what you're interested in, in oncogenetics, uh, I was wondering if you could maybe speak to how oncogenetics has changed how you treat your patients in the last 15 to 20 years. Has it, how has it impacted your field and the way you work with patients? Yeah, so there's been significant impact in um, cancer treatment um, across the board um, because of some of the genetic uh, drivers that have been identified and then targeted. Unfortunately, head and neck cancer um, hasn't um, had the benefit of, of significant change in, in either prognosis or management related to genetic biomarkers right now. Um, we really think about head and neck cancer um, as either HPV positive or HPV driven versus HPV negative. Um, and um, the HPV negative ones are are mostly uh, driven by p53 mutations mm -hmm. um, which is the most commonly mutated gene in all of cancers and is considered the guardian of the genome um, we unfortunately can't target p53 um, there are some parallel targets and downstream targets um, that are potential um, but nothing great. And the HPV associated tumors are driven by um, abrogation uh, um, by HPV proteins E6 and E7 of P53 and RB, um, also not very targetable, yeah. except good. we can prevent it with the vaccine. Of course. Um, actually, right. speaking of the fact that HPV um, does affect the P53 vaccine, uh, P53 gene, sorry. Um, that actually got me, that's got me thinking. So you mentioned in our, a uh, little earlier that um, North American uh, cancers, uh, the North American oral cancers are mostly due to HPV versus in India. One of the main causes is because of um, beetle uh, chewing, chewing tobacco, I think you said, and uh, alcohol usage. Um, is it known whether that's just because of prevalence of HPV in America versus in India? And is it just, or is it because there may be something different in the genetic makeup of people of North American descendants versus Indian or Southeast Asian, South Asian descendants? Yeah, I think it's probably multifactorial. I think there's probably um, some um, differences in, the, our, in our genetic backgrounds. I think the prevalence of the viruses may be different also, um, but also, um, there's modifiable risk factors which are practiced differently um, across the regions, including um, sexual behaviors. Um, so I think it's uh, multifactorial. That makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. As we've been kind of hinting at and kind of getting to, uh, one of the things we're really interested, in, especially at Strand, is liquid biopsies. Um, it's something that we've recently Strand has kind of, Strand has recently published a paper with you about and. I'll let RK introduce that in a minute. But um, just, you know, in general, have you seen that liquid biopsy diagnostics have impacted how you treat patients, especially in otolaryngology? Really hope I pronounced that properly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I think we, again, in head and neck cancer are lagging a little bit behind um, other cancers like lung cancer. Um, we 
liquid biopsies haven't entered the clinical realm, and I would say it's still investigational and research purposes only. Um, but what we've developed is a as a test to detect um, tumor um, somatic mutations in saliva of patients or uh, individuals at risk of developing oral cavity cancer. Um, at earlier stages um, um, for screening, but also for diagnostics, for monitoring and surveillance. Um, so we've um, published our, um, our, our study in cancer um, in December, 2020, um, with um, excellent test performance of sensitivity and specificity of about 90%. And now um, we're looking at opportunities to really bring this um, to, to patients and in individuals who would benefit the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting because, you know, the panel that we designed with you, Nishant, is, um, you know, TP53 is a big part of it, but there's scarcely any genes that lead to therapeutic implications, right? Um, yeah. I guess that's typical of oral cancers in general, right? Either HPV positive or negative. Yeah, you know, HRAS is a is a potential target, but pretty low incidence in, in head and neck cancer. Um, so that's why we really think um, prevention and early detection is is the key to making an impact in this cancer type. Yeah, I guess that you know before I I, I did want to talk a little bit about our OCSCC panel that we worked together on. Uh, but before that, what could you explain what implications it has if you detect oral cancer early, either HPV positive or negative? It's a game changer. Um, it, so when we see, treat a patient um, with advanced stage cancer, so stage three and four, it is a combination of surgery, radiation, and or chemotherapy, um, where, where the mortality is generally about 50%. This is all comers, HPV positive is much better, but HPV negative is a little bit worse. Um, with um, significant morbidity, not only from the cancer, but also our treatment, um, and at significant cost to um, individuals and, and society. Um, it, when we detect the cancer at the early stages, stage one and two, um, the treatment is limited to either just surgery or radiation. Um, so it's much abbreviated, um, less intense treatment. The survival now is about 80%. Um, and the quality of life is much, much better in terms of um, their swallowing, their um, speech, their voice, their breathing, um, some very basic um, um, functions of life. Um, and then the co cost of care um, is also significantly less. So, you know, unlike other cancers, we don't have biomarkers that we can target. Um, so we think just moving the needle to earlier stage diagnosis will make, make the biggest dent. Yeah. So it's very, very interesting that you would say that, right? Because with, you know, other cancers that are more in the news, like breast cancer, for example, you know, you have PARP inhibitor treatment and things of that nature, for example, and then there's a somatic implication to it. And there's many other targeted therapies that people can be put on. Um, but is there, is immunotherapy in this uh, picking up at all, uh, for example? Yeah, so immunotherapy um, is FDA approved for recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer. Um, it's effective probably in about 20% of our cases. Um, so again, not the magic bullet that we were all hoping for, unfortunately. But in those 20%, do you see the same sort of miraculous remission <laughs> that is seen yeah. often? In yeah, you know, of those 20%, unfortunately, not everyone is sort of this miracle, but we do see those miracles. Um, we do see a fair number of durable responses. Um, so, but it's, it's sort of all over the place in terms of the, um, the response to immunotherapy. Um, we don't understand the biology of why some patients respond better than others. So I think this is a huge opportunity for us to learn from. Right, right. And there's all this literature about hot versus cold cancers and, and you know, like exactly. pancreatic, 
Yeah, is very yeah I think you know hot versus cold or inflamed versus non-inflamed cancers, tumor mutation burden. I think the other major contributors, whether it's associated with the tumors associated with the virus or not, because those viruses are generally immunogenic also. So again, this, these are very, very complicated um, processes that we don't understand. Yeah, yeah. and on, on developing uh, an early stage oral cancer panel, um, so, you know, we, we started this in 2018, I think, right? And in fact, I think you were probably discussing it with Ramesh uh, a ways back, right? And the reason I guess it was so compelling was really two. Uh, one is, as you said, early stage. And two is also, as you said, India has the highest incidence probably in the world. And it's certainly among the cancers that India experiences, oral cancer is probably up there. Um, right. And um, so there's a lot of people out there who are chewing beetle uh, nut, perhaps chewing tobacco, maybe even smokers, some of them. I, I mean, and so we developed this panel in collaboration with you. It's an 18 liquid biopsy panel um, that is meant to detect these oral cancers early um, and is non-invasive because it's based on not, not blood as most liquid biopsy uh, assays are, but it's actually based on saliva, which is not just non-invasive, it's something you can probably deploy, envision deploying in the field, um, right? Um, so, so that's the introduction to the panel, and of course, we're out and we have a few posts out on that, so people can read it. But I was just wondering if you could comment specifically on the role of this panel and how you, well, I mean, yeah, how it came about maybe the history and maybe how you see it playing out over the next few years. Yeah. So, okay. So, you know, the panel was derived um, from using existing data that was publicly available um, from large studies through the TCGA and the in Indian consortium where yes. they identified and some of the work we had done um, identified the most commonly mutated genes. So we basically developed a Venn diagram with, with these studies and identified, we ended up using seven genes um, um, to develop this panel that represent more than 90% of, or about 90% is what we thought going in, 90% of head and neck cancers. Um, and our studies support that, that we limited um, targeted gene panel um, can identify um, about 90% of uh, head and neck cancers a priori. Um, and this, the genes uh, that we've included are P53, which is the most commonly mutated gene in head and neck cancer uh, for HPV negative um, cancers, CDKN2A, FAT1, caspase 8 Notch1, um, HRAS, and PIK3CA. Um, so of those, a lot of them are tumor suppressors. Um, the exceptions would be HRAS and PIK3CA, which are um, potential um, targetable oncogenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the where we think this has the biggest impact and how we would um, bring this out. Um, one is sort of this diagnostic in the in the monitoring and surveillance um, um, space, where patients who have um, a diagnosis of head and neck cancer and have treated been treated um, have an unfortunate risk of recurrence. So this would be a way to monitor them and keep them under surveillance um, during their treatment and subsequently after they've completed treatment. And this would complement um, the physical examination and imaging. Where we think ultimately the biggest impact is screening. So similar to colonoscopy um, for colon cancer, cancer mammograms for um, breast cancer, PSA for prostate cancer, that this could be integrated in screening protocols for oral cavity cancer, especially in um, high risk uh, areas such as India. Um, and then, you know, there are other opportunities to um, screen for HPV infections. Um, so we, you know, we think that this, this is potentially meaningful in many, many different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just so interesting that there's this discovery that, you know, of course, people talk about immunotherapy, but liquid biopsy, I mean, there's just so many applications, right? You mentioned monitoring and surveillance after treatment. You know, you just, you don't want them to keep undergoing biopsies or any kind of invasive. You just, you know, collect, in this case, it's just a saliva, it's an oral rinse, right? So yeah. um, we can do it at home, 
right? So, yeah. uh, and then send the sample and and so on. Um, and and of course, there's uh, there's screening, which is uh, you know like a population wide screening effort. Imagine uh, you know having people at high risk or um, you know uh, basically people at high risk sort of just mass screened for this. Um, how, how would how would one identify who's at high risk? I mean, would there be like just uh, factors like do you chew tobacco? Would that be part of it? Or be yes. Complex? Yeah, absolutely. So you know the the population of India is almost one point four billion, and um, the estimates are um, that uh, the prevalence um, of tobacco use is about twenty to twenty five percent. So almost wow. 300 million Indians are at risk of developing oral cancer. So very, very significant. Um, so I think the best way would be to identify patients who use tobacco products, um, either cigarette smoking or betel nut, or have a history of heavy, heavy alcohol use. And that would be our target population to screen. Mm -hmm. I, I think one thing yeah. that um, really sticks out to me at least about this panel is the fact that a lot of the people you've mentioned um, may also exist in places where um, easy access to healthcare facilities isn't always possible and having a field deployable test like this where it's literally spit in a tube and send it or or have someone go and provide them the tube for them to spit into I think that that really speaks to how powerful something like this can be in terms of accessibility um, to those who might not be able to uh, get those, get, um, you know, resources like this otherwise, and fingers crossed help out a little. Yeah, yeah so you're absolutely right. So this could be, the, the, the ease of use is, all you do is rinse your mouth and gargle with salt water. And mm -hmm. then you put put it, place that specimen in a tube um, with a biopreservative, which is stable at room temperature indefinitely. Um, and so you can do this at home, you can do this in the field, you can do this at a tertiary care center. So, you know, you can do this almost anywhere in the world. Um, and um, it's um, should should reach even the most remote areas. Um, and then ultimately, then that gets shipped to um, a lab or a central lab where the rest of the processing happens. Um, but the point of care um, is, is anywhere, anywhere um, that needs to be, um, we, can, we can provide it. Mm -hmm. No, that's, it's just, it's really, really cool for lack of a better word. Um, so I feel like, given this day and age and the unprecedented times we live in, it just feels irresponsible to not ask about COVID, um, especially given the given that you are working um, with head and neck surgery and otolaryngology. Um, and I did have the opportunity to read your paper, which, you, which was published back in April, so nearly a year ago, April 2020, about strategies of management of head and neck cancer during COVID-19. And um, I think one of the things you pointed out in the paper was how um, due to lockdown, a lot of the patients at the time uh, were being, a lot of people were being asked to stay home. And if they weren't an emergent immediate case, uh, their surgeries or their treatments were kind of put off and how those could, that could make those patients go from patients who were maybe early to mid stage, go to late stage to the point where clin um, you know surgery was not, had to be, um, was the only option. So nearly a year on, I was wondering if you could just speak to um, what you've seen happen and how, how COVID has had an impact on your patients, both in terms of their illnesses and in terms of treatment. So March um, of 2020 um, was a time of significant uncertainty for everyone, um, including us in, in healthcare and, and um, oncology. Um, where I think patients were afraid and we were afraid and no one knew what was going to happen. Um, so we saw that patients were reluctant to come in. Um, they were reluctant to definitely see specialists like me, but also present to primary care physicians. Um, we also think a lot of offices were not accessible during that time. 
Um, so even if patients had symptoms and had concerns, they just didn't know where to go. Um, and I think over time, as we learned um, more about COVID and felt a little bit more comfortable in, uh, in diagnosing and managing it, um, that then things did return back to almost normal. Um, so we definitely at that time saw patients who we would normally see earlier stages who presented at late stages. We had to change our treatment paradigms for some patients because there was this fear um, to keeping patients and their families safe. And then um, ENT was a high risk area because there was aerosol generating um, procedures that we performed. So sometimes patients um, were um, elected to undergo treatment in other ways um, chemotherapy or radiation therapy or combination chemo radiation therapy where the outcomes were equivalent. Um, we of course performed surgery if that's what was indicated and there was no other alternative, but if there was an alternative, sometimes we exercised that equal alternative. Um, but now over time, um, I think things are almost back to normal. Um, we still see some hesitation from patients um, about coming in, um, but I, I think healthcare facilities in general have um, learned a lot and have provided a very safe environment um, for patients to get their care in. Um, so now I would say there's very little impact that COVID has in, in our day-to-day -day management of patients with head and neck cancer. And that's at least in the United States. I think the rest of the world has um, different challenges um, and very specific challenges for certain countries. Uh, I mean, that's really. Do you see them coming in? More, uh, American. Back, sorry, do you see them coming back into the clinic? Yeah. We, you know, for, for cancer, we see that patients now feel comfortable coming in and we don't really see um, the, the, the okay. decrease that we saw earlier in 2020. Um, for some of our non-cancer elective, I think there's still some hesitation, but I think for cancer now, it, it's not, we don't see that anymore. I see. I see. And um, I'm on that question, Aki and I have been talking a little bit on our podcast about the vaccination, about the vaccines and the vaccination drives. Um, would these patients be eligible for getting vaccinated, or are, are like, or they maybe first in line, or are they asked to maybe wait a little longer? Is what's happening on that space? Yeah, so, you know, I think every country is doing um, their vaccinations a little bit differently. Um, in the United States, the first line was healthcare workers, um, and then it was age dependent. Um, so, um, medical comorbidities and risk and other risk factors were not um, integrated into the vaccination um, hierarchy. Um, so, you know, if the patients were above 65 or older, initially 75 or older, then they would be eligible. Um, now, I think as we're going deeper and deeper into the vaccinations, now I think health, um, health morbidities will be taken into consideration. Um, we don't have any contraindications um, for patients with head and neck cancer to be vaccinated. Um, the studies, um, you know, do not include very specific populations, um, but we don't think there's any added risk um, to patients um, who've had head and neck cancer um, to get vaccinated. But you know, we would counsel them to talk to um, their healthcare professionals if they're actively being treated. Um, if, um, but otherwise, in general, we, we don't see a contraindication. I see. Yeah. That's good to know, I guess. Um, it's quite interesting. And like you said, every country is dealing with vaccine distribution in its own way. Um, I can, I think I've been mostly focusing on India because that's where we both are right now. Um, so it's really interesting to hear how other countries are dealing with it differently for sure. So I think that's all the questions I had. Um, RK, any other questions? No, I think on that positive note that people with head and neck cancer do qualify for the COVID yeah. vaccine. Uh, uh, this has been very educative. I think uh, obviously it's very sobering at times podcast, uh, 
uh, yeah, but yes, uh, thank you so much for your time, Nishant. Um, thank please, you very much, RK. Thank you. My, my final comment, if I if you don't mind, yeah, would be please. that a lot of head and neck cancers are preventable. So I encourage people not to smoke, not to use to, um, uh, smokeless products like betel nut and not to drink excessively and really consider getting the HPV vaccine, um, which we know is, um, is excellent in preventing HPV infections and HPV associated associated tumors. Um, and I think also, since we talked about COVID, um, is once you're eligible to really consider getting the COVID vaccine. Um, I was fortunate enough um, that I I'm a healthcare worker and was eligible early and um, I have received the vaccine. Um, and I think this is how um, we get back to normal um, is through vaccination. No, definitely. Um, I definitely second that. I'm a little far down the line uh, for getting the vaccination, but both my parents actually today found out that they're eligible because um, like you mentioned, different countries have different um, hierarchies and comorbidities are pretty high. My parents have, um, my dad, my father has asthma. And so he's under, he's, you know, in the, he's going to get it this week. So I'm very excited. And I second that if whoever can get the vaccine and is eligible, please do do it. Um, so yeah, I think. Absolutely. We can end there. Um, thank you again so much, Dr. Nishant, not only for a really educational, but a really fascinating conversation. Um, uh, I really, really learned a lot and really did enjoy this. Uh, from everyone, anyone out there listening, thank you for listening. Until next time. <laughs> bye bye. Bye all. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.